first learned the phrase, God is good all the time when I was working at Bible camp. We would use it in situations, for instance, like right before you'd go into the dining hall and you had all the kids gathered and they were talking and, and making noise and being rowdy, but you'd need to give them an, uh, an announcement before they went in there. For instance, you can only take five chicken nuggets when you go through the line. So what the counselor would do would be to say, God is good, and then they would wait for the kids to say back all the time. The first time, you'd probably only get the attention of one or two. So you'd try it again. God is good. And then you'd get maybe 15 or 20 the next time. And you'd just keep going like that. God is good. Until you had a good, strong, God is good all the time. And at that point, everyone's looking at you. So maybe you give them a, a test and try it backwards all the time. And then the kids would say, God is good. Now you've got their attention. You can make your announcement. So that's kind of how I was introduced to the phrase. But since then, it has become so much more to me than just a way to get kids' attention. This has become a truth that I hold on to when I don't understand what God is doing or what something means in the Bible. The story that I'm about to share with you is a hard story. It's one that in the past has caused me to wonder, why? God, what are you doing? How could you, God? If you feel these tensions mounting as you read about Abraham and Isaac, I encourage you to breathe and remind yourself like I do that God is good all of the time, even when I don't understand. The two main characters in our story are Abraham, the father, and Isaac, his son. If you have heard our previous Wednesday night sermons, you have heard about Abraham being promised land as far as the eye can see, descendants as numerous as the stars, a great name, and a blessing from God. The descendants were to come through his son, Isaac. Abraham and Sarah almost gave up on God's promise of a baby, but when Abraham was 100 years old, finally Isaac arrived. One day, God called to Abraham and said, Take your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him up as a burnt offering on the mountain I will show to you. What? See why I said this is a hard story? I know why this is so hard for me to read. It's because I am putting myself in the story and I am putting myself in the place of Abraham, the parent. I cannot imagine being asked to give up one of my sons. There's no way, I, I could never do that. So if you're a kid watching this and you ever wonder, or you want, if feel like your parents are sometimes overbearing or overprotective, let me tell you why. It's because we love you so much more than anything in the world, and our greatest fear is losing you. So when you come to this story as a parent or a grandparent, uh, maybe you, like me, get pretty emotional about this request from God. Next we read that Abraham got up the next morning, cut some wood, saddled up the donkey, and he took two young men, as well as Isaac, to the place that God had told him. They had a three-day journey to the mountain, and when they got there, Abraham said to the young men, you guys stay over here with the donkey, the boy and I, we're going to go over here, we're going to worship, and then we will come back to you. So Abraham put the wood on Isaac's back, he grabbed a knife and something to start the fire. I always used to imagine that Isaac was a small child like too young to understand or to resist what was going on. But the Bible doesn't tell us how old he is. He might even be bigger and stronger than his old man. Remember, Abraham was 100 at Isaac's birth, so he's even older than that now. When I read it now, I think that Isaac is probably old enough to see what's going on. Because he says, Father, the fire and the wood are here but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? And what I've noticed now is that 
father has an exclamation point behind it. So I think Isaac uh, is also old enough to understand and to know that the nations around God's people, the Israelites, they have different gods and they have different practices. And one thing that they do is child sacrifice. Abraham tells him, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. I want to repeat that. God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. Keep that in mind. We'll come back to it. So up until this story in the Bible, Abraham has a track record of not trusting God, of not having faith that God will provide and keep his promises to him. He often takes matters into his own hands and it always ends up disastrously. But wouldn't you know it, this time he is unwavering. He builds an altar. He puts wood in the place. He ties up Isaac and puts him on the altar. He lifts the knife over his head. Now, if this was a TV show, this is the perfect spot for a commercial. They leave you hanging every time, and that's what I'm going to do with you for a minute. In Hebrews 11, written 2,000 years after this event, Abraham is described in this way. By faith, when put to the test, Abraham offered up Isaac. He who received the promises was ready to offer up his only son, of whom he had been told, it is through Isaac that descendants shall be named for you. He considered the fact that God is able to even raise someone from the dead. Here we get a clue as to why Abraham has the will to go forward with this. So back to the altar. <laughs> Abraham has the knife in his hand. But just in time, an angel called out to Abraham from heaven. Abraham, Abraham, do not lay your hand on the boy or do anything to harm him. For now I know that you fear God, since you have not withheld your only son from me. Just then, Abraham saw a ram stuck in a thicket, and he used the ram instead of Isaac for the offering. And Abraham named that place, the Lord will provide. Remember when I said that I was finding myself in the story as a parent, like Abraham? Sometimes what I forget to look for in the Old Testament stories is Jesus. All of the scriptures, even those that are written before Jesus was born, point to or shine a light toward Jesus. So I invite you to look back over this story in Genesis 22 and see if you can find glimpses and clues about Jesus in this story. I'm going to leave you with this one, and there are at least three that I found. Did you notice that Abraham said that God would provide the lamb, but it was a ram that got sacrificed? The lamb was still coming. Jesus Christ, Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world. You and I are not Abraham or Isaac in this story. We are part of the world, the world that God so loves. So although this story made me nervous at first glance, digging deeper, I see that it is further proof that God provides a way for his promises to be kept. God is good all the time and God can be trusted. Amen.